Every investor in the world wants to catch the wave of the next big trade. There's no time machine to go back and buy Amazon in 2013 or Apple in 2009. But what we can do is talk to the world's best traders about their next big buy. Join me, Harry Melandry of MI2 Partners, as we do exactly that on The Next Big Trade. Xi Jinping is way past being nice to the Western powers, and he's going to show that China is the old power and the imperial do dominating force that it was for a couple of millennia. And that, to me, is an existential risk for American and European businesses. And that's where I think I would point to if you were to say, what's the one thing that bothers me the most? Welcome to the next big trade. And thanks for joining us. So this week, I'm speaking to Dr. Kumal Srikumar, uh, who's president of Srikumar Global Strategies. Um, the firm was founded to advise multinationals and sovereign wealth funds on global risks and opportunities. And prior to founding the firm, um, he was the chief global strategist for Trust Company of the West. Those of us in the business often refer to it as TCW, and maybe those not in the business too, for all I know. Um, how are you, uh, Sri? How are you? Very good. Good to be talking to you today, Harry. I hope you still feel that way at the end of the podcast. We will do, <laughs> we'll, we'll do <laughs> I will tell you if things change toward the end. <laughs> you, you know, you're, you're well advised, well advised to do that. So... Um, so today we're going to be kind of doing a little tour of the global macro and, you know, and global geopolitical, uh, risks and opportunities. Um, and I think it's perfect that we have you on to discuss. Um, what's got share of mind with you at the moment? What, what's, what's kind of, what are you turning to in the news section to look at before you look at anything else these days? I think the, if you were to say, what is the one topic that dominates my thinking or what, as, as you said, that I look at when I wake up in the morning is what has happened to China, both within and China's relationship with the rest of the world. If you're looking at global risk, I don't think it is any more Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it appears as if it's partial, partial withdrawal of Russia from areas of Ukraine, that war may be coming to an end, or this may be the beginning of the end of that war. However, in China, the situation is dramatically different. You have Xi Jinping, the president, who has essentially been coronated as if he were a king, not just for the next five years, but until death, as a monarch continued to reign. And that, in turn, is going to make him very powerful and one of the areas of focus for him is to bring Taiwan back to the national China fold, as was the case with China until 1949. If that were to happen, the United States cannot sit apart. The Europe cannot be watching it. But Xi Jinping is way past being nice to the Western powers, and he's going to show that China is the old power and the imperial do dominating force that it was for a couple of millennia. And that, to me, is an existential risk for American and European businesses. And that's where I think I would point to if you were to say, what's the one thing that bothers me the most? Ah, uh, there was me feeling all optimistic when you told me that the Ukraine-Russia war was on, what was starting to wind down, and you have to we ruin it all. <laughs> we can always switch to a joke to change the mood, Harry. <laughs> have you got a good one? I'm always in the market for good <laughs> jokes. <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, I hate to say this, um, but I have been watching uh, U.S.-Chinese relations, and in fact. You know, it wasn't something – I wasn't focused on this question. I, I, for various reasons, I was quite focused on the Ukraine-Russia question. Um, but the China-US uh, question and the Taiwan question, I wasn't looking at until my boss, uh, Julian Brigden, said to me, I want you to write a piece on this. And he, he asked me to write something – I think it was 2018. He kind of came to me saying, I've been looking at this. It looks like trouble. Can you write something? He was very forward-looking if he said that in 2018, yeah. 
He was. So I went off and I, I researched this question and I ended up writing something called When Love Breaks Down, because you have to have a cheap, tawdry title, for, particularly when the subject is so is deep and disconcerting as the subject of US-China relations is. And the, the, what I discovered, um, well, first of all, I read the piece in Foreign Affairs magazine by Kurt Campbell and uh, Jake Sullivan. Both of those names will be familiar to people who are looking at the Biden administration. Kurt Campbell's what you call the Asia czar, although surely that should be the Asia emperor. But no, no. And, um, and Jake Sullivan's national security advisor. Exactly. Uh, they wrote a piece that was discussing the parameters of what they said was going to be a forthcoming heating up of the competition. Um, as I read this thing, my, what can I say? I'm a, I'm a delicate soul and their definition of competition is remarkably close to my definition of war. So I was, I was they wanted to de-risk this kind of increased comp edge to the competition between the, t the two great powers, but it just made me feel a little sick inside. Because of all the capital that's already committed to China, all those multinationals that have invested 10, 20 years worth in FDI facilities in China. And because what kind of world will we live in if all of that capital is orphaned capital? Yeah, those are very relevant questions, Harry. And I don't think we have answers to all of them yet. But here are some of the thoughts on what the multinational corporations can be doing. You can de-risk yourself by not being so dependent on China, either as a market or as a source of your input. You cannot do that immediately. We have seen that many of the computer chips are coming from that part of the world. Another risk for multinational corporations is the fact that Taiwan is the source of probably 80 to 90 percent of the microchips that are used in a good part of the Western countries. We need to find a way to gradually reduce it. A model here, Harry, would be what Germany and Italy are doing with respect to their natural gas dependence on Russia. We had a situation when Angela Merkel, who was chancellor of Germany for many, many years, and Vladimir Putin, who was a KGB captain based in East Germany, in the late 1980s, each one of them spoke the other's language. Coming from East Germany, Merkel was very fluent in Russian. And being in East Germany, Putin is fluent in German. So once the German leader spoke Russian fluently, the Russian leader spoke German fluently. And the story goes that they were so good that Merkel once corrected Putin's grammar in Russian grammar was corrected by her because she was so good at it. What does it all mean? It gave rise to a feeling of friendship, amity, saying we can depend on the Russians. We don't need to diversify our natural gas sources. We will depend on them all the time. And then, of course, we know that they are changing it in a hurry. We don't want to be in a position to repeat that experience with the Taiwan microchips and you want to be able to look at other places, maybe develop them in the United States in order to reduce the foreign dependence. So those are ways of reducing it. You cannot eliminate the China risk. You can reduce it. So I can see why you can argue that. And I, I think it's, it, you know, what? It's, in, it's inarguable, right? You, I can't really refute the points you just made. But there are costs here which won't be defrayed, even if you minimize your risk. Um, and if I were Ford, for example, or General Motors, I'd be looking at China as the source of all of my forward growth. Um, the North American market is mature. The European markets are mature. I'm looking for a nice big market where I can grow. And if it's, if it's, a, if it's too small, it won't, it'll be a drop in the ocean. It won't, uh, it will, won't matter at all. China fit the bill. It was perfect. It was a huge possible expansion. It could double the size of these com companies. Yeah, perfect for FDI. If you take China away from GM or Ford, you're taking away the growth prospects for the future. And it, the fact that they won't lose money on, on lost, on um, uh, orphaned FDI doesn't solve the problem. And vice versa. Um, 
the Korean, South Korean companies and the Taiwanese, they're all integrated uh, into the Chinese economy now. Um, they make the microchips, the microprocessors and DRAMs and stuff like that. Um, they go into assemblies that the Chinese have made, which complete our iPhones or our Android devices or our speakers or our Sonos speakers. Um, we can't, it, it will be incredibly costly redirecting all of that investment. Now, there's a positive as well. Right now, we can't even fight a war with China because we'd rely on the Chinese shipping us irrelevant parts for our missiles or, or tanks or whatever. So if you actually wanted to project military power in Asia and you didn't think it would, the war would last more than, you know, if you thought the war might last more than two weeks, then we have to develop a separate capacity to do that. And that's a good thing because we'd outsource all this capacity from the Midwest to the Chinese, and then maybe we could outsource it back into the US or maybe Mexico or other allies. Um, so that's good in some sense of if, if you were worried about not having jobs. Um, but it's bad in the sense if you like cheap stuff. Like I go to Home Depot on a fairly frequent basis because I live in an American suburb. Uh, this kind of comes with the territory. Um, and I'm used to stuff being really cheap. I don't really want to find out that it doubles in price or quadruples in price because it's been onshored, having previously been, you know, made somewhere in the great Chinese hinterland. So this is not a positive for me. This is a, a dark, disturbing, dystopian future. Let me take a different view on that, if I may, Harry. And here it is. Uh, yes, China was an easy market. You had a market of 1.3 billion people opening up to the rest of the world, did not have many of the goods and services and luxuries we enjoy in the United States. And even for Western Europe, for Germany in particular, which is a big exporting nation, China became a very important market. Now, the question is, if that were to go away, would things change? And I would hark back to a question which I think is very important in global relations, but is often not emphasized enough, and that is demographics. When you look at the Chinese population growth, the population has essentially stabilized, and the number of ch babies being born on a year-to-year -year basis reached a record low recently. What that means is that the population is graying and you, with the one-child policy that they had for a long period of time, there are not enough young people to take care of the old. So there are, if, even if everything was going hunky-dory with U.S.-China relationship, the demographics would have suggested that U.S. corporations should be looking elsewhere for their inputs as well as as markets. Keep in mind that when you old people don't buy much, look at Japan, for instance. That is, it's a country with a very aged population. They're not big importers. So what do you do? It is not, I don't think, a gray, dark future. But when you look at a good part of the emerging world, it is still undiscovered. Uh, I have worked at emerging markets for a long period of time, a good part of my 40-year career. And what I find is that the emerging markets today account for about two-thirds of global GDP. That may seem astonishing. The United States and Western Europe and Japan account for just about a third of what the world produces. Where does the rest come from? China, of course, is a good part of that. India, Brazil, Mexico, or other parts of it. And they also, the, the three countries I mentioned last, also have the advantage of a relatively young population. The average Indian is about 29 years old. The average Chinese is 39, the same as the United States. That's a surprising development because U.S. can be old because it's a developed country, but you would think the Chinese were, would be younger, but they are not because of their population policy. And specifically with Mexico, we have something called NAFTA, or the North American Free Trade Agreement, 
which President Clinton brought into being in December of 1993, and Mexico doesn't get enough emphasis as a replacement for China in terms of working in an integrated fashion uh, with the United States. So once you take into account all of those, and of course, the sub-Saharan Africa is very, very young. The average age in a place like Nigeria, for instance, is 19. So every time, every year that goes by, the population does not age at all because there are more babies born keeping the average age low. They are commercially not important yet. But I think with the passage of time, they will become important. You talked about the pain of switching over from China. Yes, it's painful. Just as we found out this year that it's painful not to depend on Russian natural gas and Europe having to go to Algeria, going to go to the United States to get liquefied natural gas. But once you make the adjustment, you will be in a stronger footing as Europe will be in a stronger footing on the energy source. I think American corporations will eventually be very stronger. Globalization will continue. It won't die, but globalization will be redirected rather than die. That's my crucial point that I have emphasized with clients. I've got sympathy with it. I, there's, and, you know, some, some of this I could get terribly wrong. And I, I have a natural tendency towards uh, the miserable, right? The, the, the miserable list. It's easy for me to see the glass half empty. Um, one of the things I, I have lots of friends in Eastern Europe as well. And my friends in Eastern Europe are very, very keen to see Europe split with the Russian Federation. They want, they want, and, and this will, one of the mechanisms they cite is Russian hydrocarbon exports. Um, now, what's bothered me about this notion of, of minimizing Russia's hydrocarbon market share is I'm not sure there was ever that much surplus hydrocarbons available to us. If anything, I think these things are turning out to be more and more difficult to obtain and that the marginal hydrocarbon is obtained at a much higher cost than past hydrocarbons. So when you take, when you force Russian pipeline gas to take a trip to India via a liquefied natural gas container, and we're, you're probably talking about A, the Russians venting a whole bunch of gas into the atmosphere. Um, it's not talked about. Uh, nobody likes to talk about it, but it's probably happening because either they're damaging their own gas wells, which I don't know how many Russians you know, but I've, these people tend to be hyper-rational, not hyper-irrational, right. uh, in my experience. Um, if if you can ever talk about big national groups as if they have one mind. Um, but uh, I'd be surprised if Russian policy wasn't involving them uh, venting gas into the atmosphere, either direct or burning it first. doesn't make an awful lot of difference for the, for the purposes of global warming. Um, and secondly... That gas has nowhere else to go. But without the pipeline, we don't have the infrastructure to redirect Russian gas to India. So to my mind, what we've just done is create a deficit globally of hydrocarbons, um, which, you know, and not an awful lot of good things come when you've got a shortage of either oil or gas or both. What the Europeans have managed to do is overbid Asia for natural gas to fill their storage over the winter. Great. Um, however, now Asia has to bid back as much natural gas as it needs for the foreseeable future. And if we get a cold snap, God help any of us, we're going to be in a difficult, difficult market condition. So for me, this is like we could have done with a cooperative solution, which allows China to take its whatever the rightful place of China on the global stage is. Don't ask me. I'm just an observer. But whatever that rightful place is, it would be nice if they could have it and we had fewer arguments. And the same is true with the Russian Federation. Whatever the rightful security arrangements for Europe and the Russian Federation, it would be nice if we could have those. And instead, we can't. We have to have war. These are bad outcomes, bad solutions, which result in, in significant negative externalities. Um, so the big question... That, Forgive me, but my retirement is the most important thing in the financial universe. Um, axiom number one. Um, and one of the questions I've been looking at is the question of when to buy long tips, right? Long tips and long bonds generally. I wanted to buy long tips because 
I think there are problems obtaining future consumption in the world we're discussing, and that future consumption may be may may come on significantly worse terms than are currently available to me. So one of the part of the mix there is higher long term inflation. We might short term inflation may come down, but over a thirty year view it may go back up again in the meantime. Aren't that many good choices for governments? So I looked at long tips and, you know, for the last 20, 30 years, you couldn't buy these things anywhere near one and a half, one and three quarter yields. You were, in the last 10 years, you were probably paying away uh, 50 basis points of real yield to own them, to get that inflation hedge. Um, now I, I, I bought some with a 2% handle. Should I be buying all of the, all of the, these long dated tips I can get? Is 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 this the opportunity at the moment? Let me give you some thoughts on my side. I have switched. I don't look specifically at tips as much as I look at long bonds, and I have changed my view from 2017, 2018, 2019, looking for them to continue the yields to continue to go up. And the, the, I'm sorry, the yield to continue to come down because there was no inflation. I didn't think inflation was going to pick up. The change in my view came with on January 5th of 2021, not the January 6th situation with the capital, but January 5th, when we had the Georgia Senate runoff elections. And I thought with the Democrats winning both seats, it was going to be more spending and more inflation and higher bond yields. And that is what we saw happen. And we saw that not only did they do it, but the Federal Reserve continued to maintain near zero interest rates. Between 2020, 2022, the Fed doubled its own balance sheet, put a lot of liquidity into the market. And only person who was surprised that inflation was not transitory was probably Jerome Powell, the chairman. The rest of us, it was clear that inflation was going to pick up. Having done that, I thought again that infl- starting uh, with this year, that we were going to see uh, lower and lower yields taking place. And we have had the yields come down and then subsequently the yields go up. My expectation now is that when you are looking at the 10-year yield at about 4%, it is just about crested. It is accounting for high inflation. That does not mean that the inflation is going to immediately come down. I think the inflation is going to stay elevated both on the high headline side as well as on the core side. But the indications from the New York Fed measurement, which takes a number of measures into account, is that various components of inflation are actually stabilizing, coming down. If that's the case, I expect long bonds to provide effective uh, competition to equities For example, if you can get 4.65% on two-year treasuries, why should you have cash? You shouldn't have cash. And if you can get 415, 420 on the 10-year treasury, even if yields were to go up and inflation doesn't come down fast enough, you will do well over the next several years' time. So the answer to your question, I hope I have answered you at least in part, Harry, is that long bonds finally are attractive in a way that they were not to me for a long period of time. So uh, it partially answers it. Um, and it's it's one thing to look at uh, real yields, another, another thing to look at nominal yields. Um, what do you think about real yields? Do you, real yields now are positive. I, I'm seeing about on 30-year tips. I mean, one second, let me tap this into a... A screen. 30 year chips are looking, oh wow, this thing just sold off like amazing. <laughs> uh, I'm seeing uh, 182 as a real yield. Um, is 182 a good real yield? Should I be content with that? Well, uh, the economy is supposed to grow on a long term at about 2.5%, in which case the risk free real yield should be just about that. But I'm not going to say to you that 
you are going to absolutely hit the peak of the real yield or the lowest level in terms of the price in terms of doing it. So I would say 182 to 2% is probably a very decent real yield, assuming you're not looking at one year, but you're looking at least three to five years ahead. Yeah, that's a 30-year yield, so uh, to uh, February 52s. Um, and, you know, I look at it partly because I think retirement income has historically been a really difficult thing to achieve. Um, and now we have a temporary opportunity. I think it's probably temporary because for the last 30 years it's, it hasn't been there. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at that opportunity. And part of it is, I guess if you were to ask me deep down in my heart, do I really believe uh, the US is going to grow at 2.5% GDP growth for the next 30 years? I'd probably tell you I didn't really believe that, that I think growth would be lower. I agree with you, which is why I said, given the uncertainty about long-term economic growth, uh, then 182 looks like a pretty decent real yield for you to get into. Yeah. Uh, Most people are not like me. They're they're not sitting there asking themselves which fixed income instrument they prefer. Gentlemen prefer bonds. I'm not much of a gentleman. But what what are your views on equities? Should we be... if you know, I, some of my friends think of equities as even longer duration instruments, but with variable with variable payout ratios. Should we be looking to, if bonds have bottomed, have equities troughed as well? First of all, let me say I'm not an investment advisor, so I'm going to not going to say <clears throat> what equities to buy or what to sell. <clears throat> but looking broadly at asset classes. I would say that equity valuations overall are still too high for me. Do not take into account the fact uh, that they have run up substantially. The headwinds today are the change in Federal Reserve policy. And easy Fed policy was a major reason why equity valuations were carried to these high levels. They are not going to have that take place. That is not to say that you may not have temporary trading opportunities. For instance, one of the risks the Fed runs by having had four 75 basis point increase in the federal funds rate in a row, which we have never done before. Keep in mind the last time we had even a single 75 basis point increase was in November of 1994. Hasn't happened since. So given all of that, the big increase is going to lead to a situation when something breaks within the system. We saw that in the United Kingdom when the new prime minister made, again, a very unwise decision in terms of uh, giving a fiscal stimulus when the central bank there was trying to cut inflation down. She actually was trying to increase inflation, which made little sense. You would expect that of an emerging market, but you don't expect that of the United Kingdom. But you saw very quickly it led to massive losses in the UK pension funds. Then immediately the the Bank of England changed policy. They eased up for a bit. If anything like that happens in the United States and we don't know where the shock is going to come from, I expect the Fed will once again cut interest rates flood liquidity, and change its policy abruptly. That's the Fed's history. And if that happens, equities are going to rally. They are going to go up. But you need a shock in order to get to that. And who's there to predict when that shock will happen? Right. Something's going to break. And you've got to, to make that prediction, you have to have a pretty good idea of where the weak points in the U.S. financial system are. And, you know, speaking off the top of my head normally the weak points are banks but the banks don't look weak at all they they look to be well capitalized they look to have been quite judicious in their risk taking over the last 10 years partly because banking supervisors have been all over them to make sure they haven't been aggressive in risk taking like they were in the run up to the uh, global financial crisis okay so if it isn't the banks that are going to break what will break I have a speculation to give you. Uh, take a, If you look at 
many of the large public funds in the country, and I think they have published the results through June 30th of 2022. We don't have September 30th numbers for many of them. If you look at the 12 months ending June 30th, they have had significant losses. Compare that with the fact that they have to generate 7 or 8% positive return every year in order to pay the retirement benefits of their workers, in order to pay various other benefit payments. So here is the comparison. Instead of having a plus 7, plus 8 figure year after year, you probably are running minus 10, minus 12, minus 15% over the last year. I'm not saying that's going to continue, but it is not clear if those funds themselves are going to run even more losses if the interest rates are going to be increased by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve says it's going to keep increasing because inflation isn't down. And so suddenly, do you have a political problem coming from various state capitals, which in turn call the Federal Reserve in Washington, D.C., to say, we need help. We cannot increase taxes of the income on income by 20 or 30 percent just to put money into the pension funds and enable them to make benefit payments. On the other hand, we can't tell the retirement people we are going to cut your benefit payments either. What do you do? And then the Fed comes in and says, OK, let's forget about inflation. Let us change the policy. We'll give a 20, 25 percent run up in equity valuations. The pension funds will be happy. And we, in turn, uh, will then look at inflation control later on. What have you achieved? You have had an equity rally when we didn't anticipate one before. Now, it's you know this is really interesting. So we talked earlier about the one China, the one child policy in China, uh, which inevitably results in uh, one child for every four grandparents. It's just an arithmetic, you know, inevitability. Um, and once you have one child for every four parents, it's not difficult to see that you have uh, for every four grandparents that you're going to have a retirement income problem. Those grandparents are kind of on their own because <laughs> they shift the, the burden is spread on their one grandchild. And so, you know, mechanisms in order to transfer uh, current consumption into the future became very popular in China and resulted, if you ask me, one of the factors causing a big real estate bubble because people didn't have the investment products they could rely on that would allow them to transfer some of their consumption from the now into the future. We have, roughly speaking, the same problem in the United States. Um, it may, Maybe that population is a little older, but we're relying for retirement income on a network of, of, of entitlements and, and, and pots of money. And actually... You know, looking at the Milliman um, tables, we could see that uh, the Fed's actions have actually made pension funds more solvent, not less solvent. Um, solvent in the sense that their liabilities are shrinking in PV terms uh, faster than the assets have been shrinking. Um, the problem they've got is that when people figure out <laughs> what that really means to them, it means the the value of that retirement in real terms is probably going down. The actual flow of, of goods and services you can afford with the inflation, it's probably you've just been haircut. You didn't you don't know it, but it's happened. You're probably gonna get haircut on your social security. Not that they're gonna eliminate it, but the COLA adjustments may not fully compensate you for the real inflation that you experience. I would say you're absolutely right to focus on uh, the retirements. People, if, if anyone's losing with the inflation, or if anyone's losing with all these factors, it's uh, either current retirees or near or almost retirees, people who are about to retire. The value of that retirement is being haircut very rapidly here and now. And I, I, you know, if I had any observation to pass on to people generally, I'd say, what do you think your retirement is? And how would you react if it was 20% worse than, than you, your current thinking? 
I don't know. Have I? Are we on the same page on that question? You're up, we are absolutely on the same page. And let me agree with you, Harry, and go one step further. Until March of this year, it was also the end result of Federal Reserve policy to essentially deny the lower income people as well as the retired people, who both of whom have to depend on fixed income instruments, because when you are old, you cannot buy equities too much as a part of your portfolio. And when your income is very low, you don't have the income to go and speculate in the stock market. So you're depending on back interest payments. And with the Federal Reserve, uh, federal funds rate near zero, the banks also paid you close to zero. So what that meant was this: the, these two very vulnerable group of people, low income and retired, were further hit by the Federal Reserve policies. Now, we are changing it from March until uh, November with the changes in the interest rate and the substantial increase in it that even in fixed income, you can get a decent return. But here is the problem. That does not serve the overall economic interest. That doesn't serve equity investors. And it does not serve the interests of very many people in the political sphere who are already demanding that Jerome Powell and his colleagues stop increasing interest rates. So systemically, there is a push toward worsening the income distribution and getting economic growth on the back of the lower income people and the retired people. In addition to the demographic issue that you correctly pointed out to, these are additional factors which are hurting the overall system. And I have spoken, I have written about trying to change it, but there is no political will to change this at all because everybody has a vested interest in continuing with the current setup. I think so. And in fact, it's worse than that. Um, sometimes you have to look for the best person to steal from. And if I were looking for, you can't really steal from young workers, young people who are actively involved in the labor market, because they will renegotiate every time they contract with their labor. <laughs> they haven't supplied their future labor, if you will. But you really can steal from pensions. Uh, you've got this contract, the contract offers them some kind of future standard of living. It's very easy to adjust it. You know, if you weren't hedged for inflation, well, it's too late now. You took a 10% uh, haircut immediately, and you may well take bigger ones. Um, and we have yet to see what happens as we have, I mean, if rates do not come down, I would expect not all credits to be money good. Some companies will have to go bust. So some, and who owns those securities? You do. America's pensioners own those securities. Uh, so if there's going to be a haircut to a standard of living, the haircut's going to be people who cannot renegotiate, cannot defend their interests because their interests are set. And that is older people. Exactly. And let me, you spoke about the young versus the old. Let me use the same analogy for the low income versus the high income people. The politics of the country runs based upon campaign contributions and the money that you need to run elections. You can't run a campaign. You can't get yourself elected into anything more than a dog catcher unless you have enough cash on hand to see you through. And they are not the low income people who are going to contribute mostly to political campaigns. It is going to be the centi-millionaires and the billionaires who contribute to it. They have an interest in how the equity market does. They don't have an interest so much in how the low-income person behaves. And that, again, continues to sustain the system. And that means you don't ha you're not going to have a change in the way things are being run. I think it's eroding the long-term viability of the system. You're eroding uh, incentives at the very base level, the incentive to work versus the incentive to not work, the incentive to set up small businesses. Um, that's doing harm. And I'm aware... I know, I know I have a few friends who are centimillionaires, not as many as I'd like, 
Um, <laughs> I have a few friends in that category. They're, they're politically active. I think it comes with the territory. When I talk to those guys about it, people are aware of exactly the kind of thing we're discussing. In fact, you know, amusingly, uh, behind the scenes, I think Fed officials are perfectly well aware of everything we've discussed. You'd think they wouldn't be, but no, they can see exactly the same things we can see. They just can't discuss them publicly. But these are pernicious developments which um, will cause longer term erosion in public confidence and in the operation of the economy. We would like to reform them. It's just very difficult to get to a place where they can be reformed. I, I agree with you completely. That's right. Reform is necessary. We know it is necessary, but politically it is next to impossible to implement it. Now, one of the great ironies of this is you go around in a full circle because, um, as I said, I could see that the guys who do foreign policy – had in mind to break America's relationship with China. They saw it as it, it, we'd gone from being a cooperative relationship to, to being one where China was a, a competitor. Um, and then they, and you'd think that commercial interests would be so powerful as to make that quite difficult to do. But the more I observe how this is evolving, the more I realize that the commercial interests can be changed like that. They could just flip. And an example being whatever is happening in Jiangjing. I don't, none of us or very few of us spend a lot of time out there. I hear the kebabs are excellent, by the way. But um, most people don't observe it. Um, however, the sanctions that have been imposed on the Chinese uh, on Chinese businesses operating there are incredibly difficult for the Chinese government to get around. Now, it may well be richly deserved. For all I know, there may be terrible things happening to the indigenous population, and people allege that. Um, I, I wouldn't dispute it at all. What I would say is if China wanted to do its best for those people, it probably wants to keep them employed. But US policy has just been directed in such a way to make it very difficult to employ them. Because if you have anything sourced from that region it's going to get blacklisted in the US. Um, and to my mind, where US policy is going, breaking up that outsourcing binge we had for the prior 40 years will reonshore jobs. And actually, it's kind of inflationary. Yeah, purely reonshoring will be inflationary. But I anticipate that, again, we spoke, but touched on it earlier, uh, rather than just re-onshoring, if you were to direct it toward more of it going from, uh, from China toward Mexico, for instance, which would be an ideal partner for the United States. And again, for centuries, the two countries have worked together in terms of things getting done. And if that were to happen and more emphasis is being put on Mexico to benefit from it, it's going to be very positive for Mexico in terms of employment, economic growth, and it would be good for the United States in terms of keeping inflation relatively under control. Again, at the same time, keep in mind that China, which uh, historically has kept U.S. inflation rate low because of the cheapness of the products that they provided to the United States, now the, their prices are going up. You can't depend, even without any deterioration in U.S.-China relationship, rather than depend on China, the U.S. dependence has moved toward the Vietnam, toward Philippines, toward India as substitutes rather than China to, uh, alone being the source. Now, I would suggest if Mexico were to become more important, if Brazil, which is the largest country in Latin America, were to become important, then the benefit is going to be to keep the inflation still relatively low. So what have you done? You have not ended globalization, but you have moved it from Russia. You have moved it from China toward other countries that you did not put much emphasis on before. Won't that require huge amounts of capital? Like Russia has a capital base that was developed um, probably suboptimally, 
by generations of people who suffered in the Soviet Union. They have these enormous steel plants that have been built by those people designed to help them win wars going forward. There's a load of capacity there that we're currently in the bit in the in the process of orphaning. The same is true for China. If you have to replicate all that capacity, you're going to have some people who can trade with both who will have access to incredibly cheap goods. And then people trapped on the, on one side of the the global economy in in the in the U.S. sphere, who will only be able to trade with U.S. sphere entities, and people trapped in the Chinese side only being able to trade with Chinese entities. That will create two different prices. It will also create these big inefficiencies. You know, the the lack of economies of scale because we're replicating everything. Um, it's hard for me to think that the price of capital isn't going to have to go up. Not not financial capital, which we seem to be able to make by flicking a pen in a Federal Reserve, but real capital. The plant effect and, and, and factories will be in short supply. Am I wrong to be that pessimistic? I think you are accurate in the short term that the rate of return demanded by the person making the investment in the Philippines, for instance, or in Brazil, would be greater than what they would get from Russia, because as you said, the capacity already exists from Soviet Union days. Uh, However, it is the same thing that I go back to when I referred to Western Europe's dependent on Russian energy. It is very cheap to get Russian energy. But on the other hand, you should not depend just on Russian energy. You should diversify because there are other geo uh, geo strat, uh, strategic reasons why you should switch. So I would maintain that while the rate of return demanded, as you said very correctly, not the financial portion, but the real rate of return will be higher by switching the dependence from China toward the Philippines or Vietnam, you're probably going to find that over the medium term, that is overrun by the fact that you have more stable sources and that it is a better way to reorient the world. Reorientation always involves pain. It involves a cost. I I don't deny that. But the question is, can you afford not to change your point of view and depend on the same old sources you did for the last 100 years? Sri, I don't even think we've got a choice here. I think our political masters will direct it such that this has to happen. They don't care what we think or what even the CEOs of these companies think. If you're making the mistake of, sort of having a big exposure, a big footprint in China, and you know, the really interesting investment problem here, right? I, I, have you seen where Alibaba shares are trading? Um, I know you don't focus on, you, want, you don't want to give anybody advice, but I've been watching this stuff and I, I would have bought some. I would have said, said, you know what, how bad can China be that these assets should trade one tenth of the, of the equivalent asset in the United States, one tenth the price. And the answer actually is they could get really bad because, <laughs> because we may not be allowed to own those assets. They may not be allowed to make profits. Um, so it's, it's really hard to call the floor on these Chinese assets. It's really hard to call the end of this process. Exactly. Uh, little and, ones were. Yeah, no, you make a very good point. And I would say to you, I, again, I don't advise on Alibaba or any other company, but look at it from a geopolitical framework. Jack Ma has suddenly become a non-entity in China because at one point, the nation's leader was concerned that he was becoming a rival to essentially the national leadership. So the the result was private enterprise has to pay a far subsidiary role to the national political uh, leadership, and that's what has happened. And once that happened, in fact, in my writings, I started to say, uh, this is more than a year ago, long before all of this happened, Two things worried me. One was the attack on Jack Ma from a from a uh, national point of view. Second, uh, the fact that the the Chinese leadership came out against the tutoring firms. You might say, why did they get into the bad books of the national leader? The rationale was 
that you are tutoring students and only rich parents can afford to pay you the fee. And of course, there are not too many children because there's only one child per family. And the, and the few of them are able to spend the time paying you for the tuition and you are worsening the class distinctions between the rich and the poor by having your tutoring firm. And so that was the reason to come down. So as soon as those two happened, I said, we simply do not know where the risk is going to come from. And so my, my advice was in China, you should look upon the China country risk or sovereign risk as having been increased, not just a security level risk, but at the national level. And we are seeing the, a year and a half later, we are seeing that to be the case. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know where this process ends, but uh, what can I say? The irony of, oh, look, the Communist Party of China, it really is communist. <laughs> Who knew? Um, well, we just found out communist is, is in capital letters for a reason. Exactly. And, uh, it's not going away. Um, Sri, that was a great pleasure. Um, we should do it again sometime. Um, if people wanted to read more of your writing, where do they where do they access you? Yeah, I am on Twitter with the handle Sri K Global, or uh, the other way to do it is I put out on every Saturday I put out something called Sri Economics, and it is on Substack. They can do go into SriEconomics.substack.com. And they can read it there as well. And every time I write, I also put it out on Twitter. So those are ways to stay in touch with me on a weekly basis. Um, and again, none of, neither of them has a pay for, paywall as of yet. Perfect. Thank you so much. Let's do it again sometime. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much, Harry. Thank you for the discussion. All right. That's a wrap on the next big trade. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, head over to realvision.com for financial insight you won't find anywhere else. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you like this show, you're going to love Real Vision Essential. At Real Vision, we talk to the most successful investors in the world and deliver videos that make finance interesting. It's all about helping you become a better, more confident investor. Now, we could dress that up in fancy marketing buzzwords, but it's really that simple. Oh, and right now, you can join Essential for $99 for a full year instead of the usual $239. Visit realvision.com forward slash Essential99 to join the Real Vision community. That's realvision.com forward slash Essential99.